Welcome to DivCasts from the University of Chicago Divinity School. For more of our podcasts and information about our terms of use, please see our website, divinity.uchicago.edu slash podcasts. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it is my honor and pleasure on behalf of the Divinity School to welcome you to this talk by Reverend Dr. Stephen Lewis of the Forum for Theological Exploration. This talk is co-sponsored by the Dean's Office, by the Diversity Committee, Chair Dwight Hopkins, which is a subcommittee of our Academic Policy Committee, and the Dean of Students' Office, Dean of Students Terry Owens. In 2010 to 2012, when the Divinity School engaged in a self-study as a part of our reaccreditation review for the Association of Theological Schools, we articulated a commitment to what we called collaborative diversity by which we meant that an institutional commitment to recruiting, resourcing, educating, and launching out into the world the most diverse faculty and student body, well, we'll keep the faculty, launch the students, (laughs) (laughs) is seen, first of all, as part and parcel to our commitment to eminence and excellence in the academic study of religion, both in general and in the context of our particular setting, the University of Chicago. It is not a side dish, but it is the main (coughs) dish. Second, it requires a set of commitments that understand how crucially interdependent are the four areas of faculty, students, curriculum, and community life. And thirdly, crucial to this dialogue around excellence here at the University of Chicago Divinity School is and has been the participation of our amazing and talented student body who, as individuals and through their leaders, leaders, presidents of the DSA, of Alchemy and Color, of Sacred Flame, of Global Citizens, and the Women's Caucus, have been in dialogue with the Diversity Committee and with the faculty about what we do well and how we do it in a particular way here at the University of Chicago, and frankly, what we do not do well, and where we need to improve in order to ensure that the most diverse body of students, racial, ethnic, gender, geographic locations, religious traditions, dispositions, and purposes for studying religion make the University of Chicago their educational and vocational home, and that when they come, they thrive here. The current talk is part of a series of events launched in the last few years, including the How to Be a Colleague series as a part of orientation, which seeks to name set up for debate and discussion and invite participation in the quest to become good colleagues as both part of global citizenship, and I personally would add, as the quest for justice in the human community that is and should be the university, but also, as Reverend Cynthia Linder and others have articulated so well for us, as a key skill for lifelong professional competence. Also last year at this time, a very successful collaborative discussion among faculty and students took place about the topic of microaggressions in the classroom and community life and how best to handle them. This year's spring event is a chance to learn from and with the exciting work that is currently going on at the Forum for Theological Exploration. With that word of context and welcome, it is my pleasure to introduce Dwight Hopkins, Professor of Theology, who will introduce our esteemed guest. Good afternoon. It's good to see everyone here in this context here at Swift Hall. Just brief introductory remarks because we want to hear the main dish, as Dean said. Since its founding in 1954, the Fund for Theological Education, FTE, has provided resources, events, networks, grants, and fellowships to cultivate tomorrow's leaders, pastors, and theological educators. FTE provides a forum for which gifted, purposeful students, young adults, and partners explore their passion, purpose, and call. The Reverend Stephen Lewis was appointed president of the Fund for Theological Education on October 1st, 2011. Since then, the FTE has changed its name 
to the Forum for Theological Exploration. Before his promotion, Reverend Lewis had led eight years of programming at the FTE. Immediately prior to his presidential appointment, he served as Vice President of Program for the FTE. His passion, his wisdom, and creativity have shown in preparing future generation of leaders, among other areas, for the church, the academy, and the larger civic society. In addition, he has an extensive history in management, business, and non-for-profit sectors geared to the vital needs of transformational leadership. Today, Reverend Lewis remains deeply engaged in the process of diversity in theological education, not only as president of the FTE, but also in his own leadership involvement with the Association of Theological Schools, the Hispanic Theological Initiative, the Pew Charitable Trust, and the growing international institution, maybe it is international, but a growing institutional network currently being forged by the FTE with a diverse grouping of organizations throughout the United States. He has proven over the years in his commitment to excellence and diversity in theological scholarship and pastoral ministry and the exploration of leadership development in these crucial areas. Please join me in welcoming the Reverend Stephen Lewis. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Dean Mitchell and Dr. Hopkins, the Diverse Committee of uh, Academic Policy Committee, esteemed faculty, staff, students, and the Divinity School community, I want to thank you for this opportunity to be with you to explore a few ideas with regards to diversifying theological education. Let me preface my remarks by saying um, diverse and diversity means a lot of different things to a lot of different folks. And within the ATS world um, and within FTE, we talk about it primarily in terms of uh, racial ethnic representation. And then we talk about um, ecclesial families, mainline, Catholic, evangelical Pentecostal, um, as the kind of three kind of research categories in which ATS operates out of. And then we talk about it in terms of geographical um, diversity. And within um, my own shop, particularly with the young adults that I work with, um, who are exploring the questions of vocation and identity. Who am I, what are my gifts, and how I'm being called um, into ministry um, or to theological, become a theological educator, oftentimes raises up questions around gender and um, orientation. And so we recognize diversity in a broad uh, swath of things. For the purpose of this presentation, I'm going to focus primarily around the issue of race and ethnicity, which assumes um, a lot of these other kind of diversities that play out within our, um, in our different kind of institutional settings. <clears throat> so let me first uh, begin by saying that, you know, that the University of Chicago Divinity School has enjoyed a long history and stellar reputation for its academic excellence. Now, while it is at the center of multi-faith and serious intellectual inquiry, the subject of religion and its intersection with other disciplines, unlike its past, the Divinity School and other theological schools must be able to make a case for their existence in an increasing pluralistic world and be able to articulate to, the, the, to this generation and generations to come why the study of religion, its value and importance beyond religious insiders and uh, professionals to a broader public if the industry and schools are to have any relevance um, to the concerns of the broader issues of the day. I say this understanding that the theological industry is under much duress and must not, and we must not take for granted that things will always be, well, we must not take for granted that things will always be as it has been, but that all theological schools operating today will be operating in the future. Now, I'm not seeking to offer reflections of gloom and doom, rather to provide a backdrop for what I believe to be an exciting time and opportunity for, theological, for the theological enterprise, assuming its leaders have the stomach and the courage to lead differently, given the influx of so many uncertainty about the future. 
Diversifying theological education does not make any real sense out of a compelling vision of the future and a context for how we might help shape and bring that vision to pass. And while many theological leaders are wrestling with how to best uh, understand and interpret the pending demographic shifts and other changes impacting the industry, the real questions are, what are we now being called to, given the changing landscape? What's our current reality? And how do we begin taking our next most faithful step from where we currently are to where it is that we want to go? If we're serious about these questions, then diversifying theological education looks vastly different than if we were committed to business as usual with some incremental change over time. So this afternoon, I want to spend a good bit of time situating the work of diversifying theological education in the larger context of shifts within uh, or across the globe as well as North America with regard to religion. And then to place that in context with the current trends and shift within the theological industry and offer, and then afterwards I'll offer a musing of a possible future and reflect on the opportunities and challenges of diversifying theological education in light of those shifts. Then I'll share what FT is uh, um, doing and offer some recommendations about how the Divinity School might create the kind of intellectual climate that continues to enhance your stellar academic practices as the broader community of conversation transition into the future. And then finally, I'll invite uh, you to reflect and ask uh, questions that you might have. Does that sound like a plan? Yeah. Good. That's all I have planned. <laughs> <laughs> so first is uh, the changes in uh, the world's religious landscape. I'm going to be referencing a lot from the Pew research and to really begin to think about how do we interpret that research, as well as some of the work that Mark Chavez is doing um, around uh, kind of congregational work as well. So the first thing is seven changes in the global religious landscape. Pew talks about this period of the next 40 years, between uh, 2010 and 2050. And I know that, in, at least in the theological world, we often talk about 2040. But Pew talks about it from a kind of uh, major kind of shift when you think about the kind of middle period of this particular century. And he says there's seven, uh, there's seven changes that we'll see in the global landscape um, as it relates to religion. First, Muslims are the fastest growing and major religious group. Second, four in 10 Christians are projected to live in sub-Saharan Africa by 2050. The unaffiliated are expected to decrease, those are would be considered to be the religious nuns, as a share of the world's population. And the United States Christians will decline from more than three quarters of the population in 2010 to two thirds. Buddhists will decline as a share of the world's population. By 2050, India uh, is to be the country with the largest uh, percentage of Muslims. And the number of Muslims will nearly equal the number of Christians around the world by 2050. That's a vastly different landscape than the world that you and I occupy now and the ones that our professors and parents came into uh, a decade ago. Or two. And so as we think about this, then the question then becomes, um, how do we make sense of this? So part of what they talk about is the changing uh, regional distribution of Christians. The first thing they said is, you know, as you look at this particular, uh, this next slide, look at where the projected growth and decline of Christianity are during the next 40 years. <coughs> What do the three countries where Christians will live suggest about the racial ethnic makeup of, of Christianity worldwide? In Latin America, continent of Africa, and Asia and Pacific. 
that the, that the growth is going to be in these contents where we have a vast majority of persons of color. That 75% of the change in the world's Christian population will be persons of color. And globally, 2040 has already come. Globally, the, back, the globe is already majority persons of color. So then the question then becomes, you know, how, how do we make sense of this kind of Christian growth compared to the overall growth? Well, the population growth among Christians on countries uh, 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 with the highest concentration of change are, again, as I said, uh, with and among persons of color. So you see here um, Christians within sub-Saharan Africa, uh, sub Africa is a 15% increase in population. You see in the Middle East, in North, in, uh, North Africa, 43%. Asia Pacific, 33%. Uh, Latin American, Caribbean, 25%. But look at Europe and North America. So that kind of gives us some sense of kind of global kind of perspective of Christianity, when you look then at the unaffiliated population, remember they said it's going to decline over the next uh, 40 years, what we see from 2010 to 2050, uh, the unaffiliate is 92% in Africa, even though North America as a whole is only population only growing by 26%. Its unaffiliated rates are growing by 89%. Northeast and North Africa and Latin America, 56 and 44%. So what we see is that while, while uh, it, the unaffiliated population will decline in terms of percentage population, within the U.S., it's growing or outpacing. U.S. population changes. So that gives you some sense of the type of global major shifts um, as it relates to the demographic changes of race and ethnicity within Christians across the globe. So let's just talk just for a few moments about changes within America's religious landscape. So there are five changes. Um, within the landscape. So the first one is that the fast growing Christian population in North America are immigrant communities of color and Pentecostal communities of faith. Christians are declining both as shares of U.S. population and in total number. And within Christianity, the biggest decline declines have been within mainline Protestant traditions and among Catholics. The decline of Christians in the U.S., corresponds with the continued rise in the share of Americans with no religious affiliation or who are considered to be religious nuns. The major trend seen in America uh, in, in American religion since 2007, the decline of Christians and the rise of the nuns have occurred uh, in some form across many de demographic groups. So what we'll see in here is that you know, that the, the vast majority of nuns would come from mainline and the assumption is majority white. But that doesn't mean that the nuns are not in communities of color as well. And then what we see is, you know, non-Christian faiths such as Islam and Hinduism um, are starting to grow. Modestly. Let's talk a little bit about race and ethnicity. So we've already mentioned that, you know, that uh, the fast growing Christian population in North America are immigrant communities of color and Pentecostal communities. But what we see is that non Hispanic whites now count for smaller shares of evangelical Protestants, mainline Protestants, and Catholics than they did seven years earlier. While Hispanics have grown at a share of all of these religious groups. The other thing that we see um, is with the unaffiliated. So the biggest, one of the things here is that mainline Catholics suffer the most from 
folks switching their different uh, religious affiliations. You see, Catholics have a, a you know have a decline from 31 percent to 10.9. We see main lines drop from uh, those who raising raising grew 19 percent to a negative you know a change of 14.7, um, which is you know 4.3 percent. And historically, black are maintaining some uh, consistency um, that we see here. <clears throat> But the other thing that we see is that unaffiliated is making up across the generations that millennials and Gen X make up uh, the vast majority of those who consider to be unaffiliated. So, in the U.S., we see the fast growing populations are within community of color, immigrant Catholics and Pentecostals. The we see growth in terms of the unaffiliate, which are majority white, and millennial. And so a word about millennials that I want to share is that they are driving the growth of the nuns. What we also see is that they are also um, <clears throat> leaving their childhood religion and becoming unaffiliated. And most of them who were raised without any type of religious affiliation stay there. So we don't get them back in terms of, you know, um, Christian. Two thirds of millennials who were raised unaffiliated are still unaffiliated, and a higher retention rate than most other major religious groups, and much higher than for older generations of nuns. But the other thing that we see among these millennials is that they want to make a difference in the world, and they're not really sure that the church or the academy is a place in where they can really do that. We'll talk a little bit about that in just a moment with uh, FTE's work. Part of the question they're raising is, that are their parents' institutions places where they can actually lead and thrive? They are committed to the connections of faith and service. They are uh, interested in the questions of scholarship and what relevance does it have in the communities in which they come from and where theological institutions and Christian communities are embedded in. <clears throat> the other thing that we see is that, what I've already stated, is that their, their desire then is to work in other kinds of institutions that attend to justice. So how is Chicago the biggest school attending to uh, the violence that takes place in Chicago? How is theological schools in the industry as a whole attending to the issue what we see in Baltimore, in New York, in South Carolina? What ways is theological education not only helping people to think theologically, but think theologically and act theologically around the issues of justice? How do congregations of theological schools help people to think about the real issues of reconciliation and what it looks like in communities where they've been neglected for years and decades by law enforcement? I think there's huge, tremendous opportunity for theological schools and their educators to attract these young leaders who now only have the categories of uh, political science and business and economics to deal with the issues. But the thing about the theological degree is that it's interdisciplinary and help, can help ask questions and think about praxis in ways that these other disciplines do not allow. The other thing that we see is that they want to serve the church but to them, most often, that means serving the church's mission in the world. For many of them, ministry is a way to follow Jesus Christ, not their commitment to membership in the institutional church. Now, I know Robert Putnam talks about this whole notion of folks becoming uh, less uh, affiliated with institutions. The last time I checked, whether you're millennial, Gen Xer, or a boomer, 
We're still connected to financial institutions. We're still connected to food institutions. We're still connected to institutions that deliver goods and services in terms of our clothing. And for those of us who like our technology and gadgets, so it's not that they're disassociated or uh, somewhat allergic to institutions. It's just the particular kind of institutions in terms of their relevance about their life and the questions that they're raising as it pertains to how they go about their life. So part of the question is then, what do these trends mean for theological education? Well, I mean, first is is that um, we need a better understanding of the kinds of leaders we need now. I did a listening tour a few years ago um, within our organization. Part of the question that we asked is, what kind of leaders does the, does the church and the world need now? Not the kind of leaders that we're training within our classrooms, but what kind of leaders does the church and the world need now? Given these shifts, and the variety of different things that we see within the larger public. And getting a grasp on that, then the question that becomes, what is the profile of these leaders who will occupy our classrooms? And what do they need to be successful as ones matriculating through a PhD program or those who sit in your class thinking about the practice of ministry? The second thing I think that these trends that these trends represent is recruiting and training different kinds of diverse theological educators and scholars. So right now, most of our systems are set up where folks come in and you get in where you fit in, and you basically learn what it is that we teach you. Versus thinking about who are the people who are going to be sitting in these seats that you're occupying now into the future. What are their needs and what are the implications about how we train the kind of scholars that we need to serve and to prepare them for how they'll lead in the world? And the kind of dramatic trajectory of PhD programs is not going to get us to where we need to be. So it includes the historical ways in which we train folks, but it also includes new ways of thinking about how we train the kinds of leaders who will be standing in front of the classrooms and teaching the type of intellectual uh, wisdom that theological traditions offer. Which means, which we'll see a little bit later, is that as you, as you have a more diverse population of students sitting in the classroom, how then does the intellectual inquiry become relevant and speak to the broad diversity that we see in the classrooms? Thirdly is this whole idea about designing curriculum that attends to the shaping of the imagination and relevant intellectual and practical capacity building. So it's not just studying and not learning the academic disciplines for the discipline's sake, but how does the discipline speak into building the capacity that prepares the leaders for what it is that they're going to face in the years to come? How does our curriculum prepare people and build the kind of practical capacity building to be able to advance the kind of practical wisdom that is necessary? to lead as religious leaders. But finally, what I think these trends suggest is that, and what we'll see in just a moment, is that many of the leaders of theological schools will have to develop an organizational mindset and build their own strategic capacity building. And why? It's because most of these institutions are becoming uh, more financially lean, and stressed. <clears throat> they have all these different kinds of uh, 
uh, concerns and complexities that they have to deal with if they're embedded institutions like a divinity school or if they're freestanding institutions? <coughs> and where in their professional development are they prepared to think organizationally and lead organization beyond their academic program? How do they learn the stuff of organizations that helps them think uh, about a systems approach to their work and think about where are the key leverage points about where we need to invest now? How do they locate the locus of power so they can then determine where and where they begin to actually begin to institute change within the institution versus bumping their heads up against the broader university uh, community or their own boards. Where do you learn these capacities to run these kinds of institutions? These larger trends are going to complicate and complexify the ways in which we have to lead and teach into the future. And so I believe that, you know, that, that these four things are reflective of at least offer some ideas about what uh, these trends suggest what theological um, institutions and their leaders might consider as we move forward. So changes in the theological education landscape. ATS Director uh, Dan Alshire says that the story of the next 10 decades, or the next 10 years I should say, or two decades, will be about the grand diversification of the field. That the way that ATS schools teach, what they teach, who they hire as faculty, and who is matriculating through graduate theological programs. That during the next two decades, by 2032, the American population will have completed a fundamental shift that began in the late 19th century, that this nation of immigrants larger from Europe, and the British Isle will only be a few years from becoming a nation in which white will be the racial minority. By 2040, persons of African, Asian, Hispanic descent will outnumber white residents. <clears throat> this is Dan's perspective from where he sits uh, looking at this universe of more than 260 theological schools and trying to read the trends what we see in Pew and other places as it relates to the, the coming of this kind of uh, shift within a larger country. Barbara Wilder's research, uh, who is a researcher of the ATS but used to be the director of the Center for the Study of Theological Education Auburn Seminary, she says that the enrollment of groups other than white has been growing fast and will continue to increase at higher rates because those are the groups that are growing in the population as a whole. That the religious segment of the population is changing even faster in its makeup. She further says that because people of color are growing fast as a percentage of religious adherence compared to the white counterparts who are declining as a percentage, diversity should come sooner within the religious population than 24. And further, that the population of doctoral graduates will be teaching will be very diverse, racial and ethnic. So hiring institutions eager to attract the demographic groups that are growing in the wider population will look for new faculty who can mold their teaching to the experiences and the aspirations of these diverse groups that occupy your classroom. The leaders in theological institutions, she says, and denominations acknowledge this reality. But they don't adequately know how to address the issue of diversity within their institutions. Juan Martinez, who's over at Fuller Seminary, talks about how white students uh, account less than 50% of the general seminary population sometime during 2020 and that in some seminaries in the region of California already majority non-white, that those of the largest minority student population are all evangelical institutions. So 
the second one is change and enrollment. We'll talk a little bit about leadership, CEO, CEOs, and then change in the job market. And then financially stressed institutions. So changes in enrollment. Here it gives you kind of a, a trend, a 20 year trend, of what has transpired. So MDiv enrollment has been hovering right around between 25 and 30,000 students. If you look at enrollment by age cohort, the largest cohort are 50 and older or um, between 25 and 30. And you see it kind of trending smaller. So the kind of 30 to 40 are shrinking and we have folks that are boomers that are going back to seminary and those between 25 and 30 who are in seminary. Look at it another way. Um, you have uh, you see kind of the the growing number of fifty to sixty four year old between nine and eleven, and then you have a drop off between twenty and twenty nine, but still at a large you know at a larger number than what we see between thirty and thirty nine and forty and forty nine. In terms of racial ethnic. Uh, enrollment. African Americans um, are growing right around 2013. We see them, you know, peaking right around 14 percent. Then we see uh, Asians and Latinos kind of hovering at a little above eight and close to six percent. So we see the enrollment numbers increasing for students of color why it's plateauing with those who are considered to be the majority uh, student population. Compared to uh, faculty diversity, students in terms of all membership schools are right around 38% students of color. Faculty diversity is right around 17%. And the interesting thing is that when you do a kind of seven year trend compared 2007 to 14, Look at this, we see the vast majority of Asian American faculty are in evangelical schools, 79%. We see the vast majority of African American <clears throat> faculty in evangelical schools, 52%. And so the mainline schools have been hit the hardest in terms of these, uh, these shifts. And then again, among Hispanics, Latinos, uh, 63%. So in each of these three major categories within uh, faculty of color, the vast majority of them are in evangelical schools. This gives you a little bit of uh, some of the demographics as related to faculty, and I wanted to kind of point your attention to the kind of yellow blocks. So over a seven year trend, what we see is a 1% change in terms of Hispanics, Latinos, being in the CEO position. That would be the dean or the president. Uh, that would be the dean within a divinity school like um, Chicago or the seminary present within a free stand. And then you look at uh, these percentages in terms of com the comparisons between the academic dean position, CAO, uh, over a seven year trend. So Asian Americans up 4%, African Americans up 4%, Hispanic, flat. Um, you find more. Uh, Scholars of color stepping into the CA position, which usually is a gateway into the presidency. But then look at the faculty um, down here at the bottom. You see, um, and compared to the census, uh, Asian American faculty are overrepresented. When you compare it to the US census, they represent about 4.5%. African Americans are 8%. Um, which are, if you look at kind of a representative of the larger population, is underrepresented in theological schools. And the 
Hispanic Latino scholars are the most underrepresented group within theological institutions. Which brings a whole different kind of um, issues related to diversity, around language, and orientation, and um, ge geography, as well as ecclesia family. When you look at the eight year total, look at the disproportion of women in leadership in theological schools compared to their male counterparts. Particularly in light of U.S. census, so women are somewhere right around 50.8, but yet they're only about 23%. And then, uh, and again, these are eight-year totals, so this is the aggregate of, of an eight-year period. Um, and then, you know, men are 77% within theological uh, faculties, but U.S. Census, they're about 49.2. So in FTE's program, the vast majority of the folks who come through our program are women. So what does this mean? For women who are thinking about theological degrees, thinking about opportunities for leadership, and what does it mean for your community who's interested in justice and equity? How do you create space for your, for the system? and roles of leadership, and spaces within the classroom, and then leadership within the broader uh, community. As we think about the issue of diversity. The other thing too is that when you disaggregate gender from race, mm -hmm. the most underrepresented group are African American women and Latino women being the largest underrepresented group within theological family. And yet we see in all the trend lines that the fastest growing populations are what? Latino uh, leaders with, who are immigrant Christian or Pentecostal. And then we saw in the enrollment numbers that you know there's a, it's a fast growing number of Latino scholars coming into, I mean, uh, students that are enrolled. So think about the type of cultural community that the students have to travel when they come to a theological school, particularly if they are a Latino, like if they are a Hispanic Latino woman. Cultural community, as well as the language community. And what does that mean for theological schools as we think about this increasing population of them uh, in these institutions? And the same will go for African-American women as well. A little bit about the financial reality is that 27% of the 775 independent schools have balanced budgets. 27%. But 73% of these schools have deficits between 250000 to a million. The schools are in, in so much uh, distress financially, it makes it very difficult to even begin to have some breathing room and space to be able to think about all the other issues that you relate to the demographic and other kind of diversity that you're trying to attend to. I'm sure the dean can, to it, can attest to that. <clears throat> but it also, speaks to the issue of uh, student debt, and it also speaks to the reality of the job market. So when you think about those who prepare for PhDs, there's a glut of PhDs. There's too many PhDs who are trying to find jobs. But as you saw in that Barbara Wheeler research, the hot commodity or the most desirable uh, Scholars are scholars of color who are finding jobs. And so what does that mean for faculty that's thinking about putting cohorts together of who's going to matriculate through our PhD program that is not based on the buddy system or folks that you have been you know, tutoring and uh, want them to come up and study up on you and think about what are the real needs of the school and what it is that we're trying to do as an academic institution. 
especially if we talk about the kind of excellence um, that an institution like this will continue to live into. The real question is, what do we do when our maps no longer work? Our academic maps, our pedagogical maps, our theological maps are in distress. What do we do? How do theological schools begin to wrestle with this larger question? Well, part of it is that, you know, um, the leading institutions of tremendous crisis, conflict, and massive failure, a time of painful endings and hopeful beginnings. It is a transitional period that feels as, as if something profound is shifting and dying while something else wants to be born. Part of the work of theological schools and its leaders will have to be engaged in this work of metanoia. It's a shift in the way we see, think, and act. That we gotta be able to break out of the normative patterns in which we've been operating in long enough to have some breathing space to be able to see from the balcony what's, what's coming ahead and how we're being called to be responsive to that. So, Here's one music. Imagine with me for a moment the future. This is Christian Century. The, ad the, ad the average age of clergy serving churches in the new worship community is under 40, which is one of the big concerns of denominations and what theological schools have been uh, set up to serve these institutions which are also waning and being stressed in their own respective context. Another headline. Young evangelical social innovation church renewal. Young adults on the four, uh, are on the front lines of major church renewal in the United States has not seen since the 1960s as a result of their participation in Atlanta-based organization faith-based volunteer service initiative. Imagine. Another headline, September 19, 2026, New York Times. Charity Water and ATS School partnered to cultivate leaders of Christian communities who organize water efforts in Africa. Theological Education is Khan Academy, which is different from MOOCs and other kind of online ways in which we've been thinking about how we deliver, have an online delivery system which is part of what we're transitioning from is an industrial age and ways in which we've delivered services to this knowledge age period, which we still haven't figured out what that's gonna look like in this um, first half of the 21st century. Grand Rio Times. Brazil's Ministry of Education partners with the University of Chicago to develop theological educators. Byline by Reginald Braga, uh, University of Chicago has expanded its doctoral training to Brazil, a chief supplier of Latino scholars. BBC, seminaries become laboratories for social enterprises. FT broke its relationship between theological institutions and social entrepreneurship, which has catalyzed change in schools, faculty, curriculum, and enrollment numbers. National Geographic scholars of color are creating solutions in the environment movement. The story about a high team of diverse scholars have taken this scholarship mainstream and are experimenting with viable solutions south of the equator and inspiring a new generation of Christian leaders, pastors, and scholars interested in the global environment and environmental movement. Now, none of those headlines are true, but imagine a future that theological education and its wisdom is powerful broader than just the context of church and the domain of the religious set. That it actually can be leavened within our broader communities. Stanford Social Innovation. 
2030. She's back. How the church rediscovered its relevance in the public domain of social good. <laughs> By line, Mary Magdalene. She's an old sister. <laughs> Just when the church appeared to be on life support in many cities and communities, has been revived and is playing a major role in transforming communities across the country as a result of a new intergeneration, new intergeneration of millennials, Gen Xers, and booming Christians thinking different and leading the church and theological academy to the forefront of the social good movement. The question is, can you imagine that? Is it plausible to think that it is possible that what you do in these hollow walls has relevance beyond the theological bubble and church bubble in which we live. Imagine 25 years from now. Some of you I know you finished up PhD programs or whatever. I'm banking on the fact and expecting, have high expectations. For 25 years from now that you're going to be making a tremendous impact, not just in theological institutions, but beyond. Imagine, 15 years from now, 23rd. For those of you who are practitioners, it's not that far away. Imagine, 10 years from now, what's possible? What do you see emerging? How are we being called now in light of these shifts and demographic changes. Because I think if we can imagine an alternative future, perhaps then we can think about uh, the opportunities and challenges that are before us. So the first one is, is that, you know, one of the things that I, when I did this listening to about 230 leaders across the country in eight different, nine different cities, one of the things that we heard is that the leaders of theological education were saying that we need to, re we need to reevaluate theological education. But more importantly, we need to begin experimenting to learn and shape a different kind of future. How many of you are familiar with IDEA? It's an industrial design firm. They have this whole idea, this concept of build to think. And that's a novel idea for those who spend their life dedicated to the life of the mind. But part of it is about um, getting your ideas outside of your head and doing small, rapid, cycle kind of prototypes to see what might emerge so that you can learn from it, evaluate it, and then scale and see what you throw away and what you keep and, and scale it to the next level. The second thing is come to the terms with diversity and its implication. Come to terms with it. Let's not just talk about it. Let's not do the honorifics where, you know, well, not on my watch, but when I'm on my way out, you know, the next thing that you all should do is hire or think about a person of color. Why don't we start coming to terms with diversity and its implications for our schools now? prioritize. Let some important things go in order to let some important things emerge. You can't do everything. As I had a board member used to say to me, he says, man, there's a lot of good things to do in the world. And there's a lot of good things that need to be done. The question is, is it your good thing to do? There's some things that we've done it's not going to carry us forward into the future. So how then do we begin to discern what those things are that we should let go of? To celebrate it, retire it, and welcome in what is to come. Because to address the issues of diversifying theological education is going to require you to create some space in your schedule in your hearts and in your minds so that you can begin to do that. And the only way you can do this is to stop prioritizing and think about 
What is that we can do and what is that we need to let it go? And then this is another important one. Let's sit with uncertainty. Embrace the unknown. Take bold, courageous, faithful steps towards the fierce urgency of now. Back then, King wasn't talking about, you know, what's going to happen 50 years from now or 20 years from now. So what Thurman says, what do you do when your back is up against the wall? Empire has its neck, has its foot against your neck. We're not praying for some sweet by and by. How do we work now? Because one of the things I've realized is that most of us are not motivated by numbers and statistics. You know that old adage say, you know, if we knew more, we, you know, if, if we knew more, we would do more. But that's not true. We see and recognize that the actions are motivated by values and convictions. What is that we value? What do we really, what do we really have solid convictions around? Those are the things that move us, and those are the things that become our own kind of fierce urgency. But part of this is recognize that we're not going to have all the answers. I mean, that's part of what it means to be religious leaders. That's what it means to be leaders of faith. But it is walking by faith, not sitting by faith. It's taking steps not knowing what the future might hold. Maybe making some mistakes sometimes. So all these are opportunities, but at the same time they're challenges. Because we know the real challenge that is before us in terms of what we have on our own plates in terms of what we think we have in terms of resources or not, in terms of what we think we can or cannot do. So what's FTE doing? 60 years ago, the world in which many of us occupied, I wasn't even born, so. but the world in which many people occupied was a very different place than it is today. At the end of the spring academic year, the United States Supreme Court ruled segregation in public education was unconstitutional. But 20 days earlier, April 27, 1954, um, an organization of cause was born, and that was FTE. And so right along with the Supreme Court, FTE has had this agenda of diversifying, or I should say, uh, yeah, diversifying segregated theological schools. Not because we needed more representation, per se, because ultimately what we believe is that diversity, a diverse faculty represents the kind of excellence that any institution wants to hold. That the diversity of uh, theological schools is not just about how you can do replacement of one ethnic group for another group, but it's about how do we have the type of diverse type of faculty that can prepare the kind of leaders that the church in the world needs now. I don't know if you read uh, Scott Peck's book, um, Difference, but he talks about this whole idea that um, diversity always trumps ability. That 99.99% of the time, heterogeneous communities are out problem solved homogeneous communities. And so when you think about the complexity of what theological schools and uh, communities of faith uh, are dealing with, It would behoove them to have the kind of diversity represented in their own institutional leadership so they can harness the type of collective wisdom that's necessary to think about the creative solutions and only address the opportunities that are before them. 
So for us as an organization, we have been trying to work on this issue of diversity for more than uh, 50 years. And part of what we realize is that our work is really trying to work at the leadership arc. So it's not just about um, identification. We do want more scholars of color uh, matriculating through uh, PhD programs. We do want a diverse body of young leaders that are wise, faithful, and courageous leading the church and academy. But we're also interested in their preparation. Their preparation which cannot all be handled within a theological school or a three-year degree. But the thing about the arc of their preparation and who are the other partners that partner with theological education in the, in the preparing of these leaders. But then also the practice of theological educators. So helping you know young leaders who go on to do a PhD to think about that yes, uh, becoming a faculty is is a goal. But we also want you to think broader that you know that you may have visions of being an administration and an academic dean, and you may even have visions of becoming seminary dean and president. One of the things that we're looking at now, given those numbers of CEOs and CAOs, is that we're looking at persons like an Emily Towns at um, Vanderbilt. To ask the question, what difference does it make when you have a person of color leading these institutions that have PhD programs? How are selection process is different as a result of persons of color as well as their white allies who are leading these kind of institutions. How is recruitment different as a result of these persons in leadership? Because we've been giving fellowships for 50 years and we've only been able to move the bar from 3% to 17%. So part of the reality is that we have to realize that part of the issue is in the structural aspects of organizations. So part of what we realize is that we have to take a number of our activities and we have to fit them together to think about what are the kind of strategic leverage points in order to advance our work. So you have this, uh, this image here. Give me a level long enough and a fulcrum on which to place it and I should move the world. So we are leveraging doctoral networks, which we're just in the uh, beginning stages of trying to bring that online to deal with the structural issues within institutions. <clears throat> we're dealing with mentoring uh, as we recognize that mentoring is a major component um, of young people who are, who are in discernment and who are preparing for leadership um, on theological faculties and in the practice of ministry. We also recognize that fellowships are still an important um, uh, resource for those who are pursuing PhDs. And we also recognize that people can't do this work alone. That people are asking similar questions so community support is, is, is important. So those four activities are being fit together in very strategic ways in order to address the systemic and structural issues of diversity within theological schools. So part of our work then focuses on kind of fitting together, as I've said, fellowships, mentoring uh, consortium that we put together, a doctoral network, and the leadership form and, ment and uh, mentoring opportunities. So these two up top are the work that we do with students, the ones down at the bottom are the work that we do with institutions. I think it's important to know that one of the things that we realize for our work is that we can't continue to do our work in silos given what we know of the shifts within the larger landscape. <clears throat> that the challenges that we face will not be resolved in our academic, ecclesial, geographical silos, or even academic disciplines. That only the most collective, only the most creative and innovative ideas are at the margins of different worldviews where they bump up against one another. <clears throat> 
So how does the church and the academy come together and begin thinking about how we address these issues of the leadership pipeline? How then does the theological faculty work with uh, the faculty and other disciplines within the University of Chicago, whether it be in um, political science or whether it be in business to address the leadership pipeline and to prepare the kind of leaders that we need? Part of our work is that we understand ourselves as a leadership incubator. So for 60 years, we've understood ourselves as a fellowship-making organization. But now, we see ourselves as an organization that is uh, really trying to incubate the kinds of leaders that the church in the world needs now, the church and academy in the world needs now. So we work with incubating doctoral students and institutions. In other words, we try to create a space where they can leverage collective resources and ideas, ask them what kind of questions, share data, as it relates to what they need collectively and individually to do their work as, as effective as possible. Within our uh, doctoral networks, we really uh, have demonstrated the ways in which this is a community that supports and uh, holds these colleagues together as they kind of travel along a doctoral um, program and, and try to get out. But the other thing about this leadership incubator that is about the vocational transformation. So how do we help people to really understand who am I, what, am I, what are my gifts, and how am I being called into the world? And how then we help them think about what their role is to pay it forward in terms of the next generation. The other thing that I would offer is that part of what we've recognized that our work will continue to be about representative diversity. You gotta have people in the pipeline uh, to be able to have a conversation and to be engaged or be at the table in talking about the issues of a diverse faculty and diverse leadership, et cetera. But one way that we're transitioning in our work is to think about the kind of organizational value of diversity and problem solving. And part of that is um, recognizing that I mentioned earlier today um, Scott Page's book, Difference how the power of diversity creates better groups, firms, schools, and society. Listen to what he says. He says, he argues that uh, diverse perspectives, heuristics, interpretation, and mental models improve our collective ability to solve problems. Diversity for him means that the very ways people see, think, and act together to improve conditions in our institutions, communities, and the world can be a catalyst for innovation and progress. For me, I find Scott Page's work to be compelling when many institutions in this country and the majority of their leaders have not come to value diversity beyond the discourse of represent, representative uh, representational inclusion, cultural assimilation, colonial proselytizing, or commodifying new markets of people of color, or vice versa in the name of multiculturalism. What Paige reminds me is that there's so much more than simply the issue of inclusion. Whether that is race, geography, ecclesial, gender, orientation, etc. He says that real efforts toward valuing diversity as meaningful practice of honoring and respecting difference requires communities and institutions and their leaders to start acting courageously and risk losing their life as they know it. So this last part of this kind of diversity puzzle then is about institutional capacity to thrive. One of the questions that we're asking and working with institutions and these type of structural issues around diversity in their context is, what do scholars of color need in order to thrive? And how then do you create the kind of environment that allows a diverse theological faculty to thrive. Recognizing that diversity is not um, a threat, but it's really a core value. And that when we invite diverse faculty, that we should be open to the reality that we also have diverse canons in which we're working on. 
and that is all to the to the collective wisdom of your institution that's necessary to address the opportunities that are before you. So let me conclude by saying this is one of the questions that uh, is on your website about the school. Well, I turn it into a question. But how do we create an intellectual climate that continues to enhance a stellar academic practice as the broader community of conversation transitions into the future? Well, part of what I think is um, we got to become more proactive in shaping the future than just being responsive. Now we have, you know, these persons of, uh, uh, on our campus are matriculating within our institution. Now we have this group um, that's in our. The real question is what's the compelling vision about where you want to be and how you create the kind of space for well, all of your students and theological leaders and practitioners can thrive. We gotta examine the implications of, of the diversification, the disidentification, and the unaffiliation as it relates to the population of people that will occupy your um, classrooms in the years to come. They'll be more diverse, um, they'll have less of an identification with a particular denomination. And the vast majority of them will probably, maybe not the vast majority of them, but a good percentage of them will be folks who are kind of first career Christians or they're just not affiliated at all for that matter. The second, uh, the third thing is to discern what leaders need versus what theological educators are trained to do. Now, I've, I've heard many of my peers who are running schools say, well, you know, that's getting into the whole type of market, uh, marketplace um, and kind of consumerism. And that's one way of looking at it. The other way of looking at it is, are you paying attention to your constituents? And are you attentive to what it is that they really need in order to be the most effective kind of leaders that come through your program? Because at the end of the day, it's about your reputation and your legs. And then it's about exploring uh, diversity um, beyond uh, representation, as I've already stated. Too often what I see in theological schools is they try to address the diversity issue, Dean and Dr. Hopkins. The first thing they do is run to is curriculum revision, curriculum revision. In ATS, um, they, in the last you know, I think it was between 11 and 12, they had maybe 100 new programs that would come in online. And it just seemed like people were just kind of throwing programs against, you know, against uh, accreditation to see what sticks. Versus really thinking about and recognizing that curriculum revision is not an effective tool for organizational change and development. It's complementary, but it is not the tool to transition and transform your institution to address the kinds of leaders that you need now. It's understanding the kind of leaders that you need now, then understanding who are they, who are the persons that are occupying your space, and then try to figure out, given that, what does it suggest about the kind of curriculum that we should be putting in place? This goes back to the larger issue about what I was saying about how theological leaders have to develop an organizational mindset and capacity and strategic capacity. So I'll stop there, but that's a lot for you to digest. But um, I believe that this is a, a tremendous time and opportunity for us to be thinking about the ways in which we can think creatively about how we do our work. And again, I say that the disciplines within, even the traditional disciplines within the actual, um, within a theological education, I think has, is, is, uh, is palpable to a much larger community than the way, and then what we're actually, and who we're actually delivering our work to. I'm just thinking for instance like hermeneutics or biblical interpretation. So one thing, you know, is, is about how you read this kind of, you know, the type of 
literary interpretation and the other kinds of way, but you can transfer that and think about so how do you read communities? And how do you read those communities through these different type of hermeneutics? Um, it's thinking about theology and how do you help people think and develop a kind of a moral imagination in which they operate their work, whether they're going to be a doctor or a lawyer, um, etc. It's helping them to think not just theologically, but how do they act theologically around issues of justice and reconciliation. It's thinking about, you know, how do you take uh, Christian worship and think about its root of liturgy being liturgy, which is about the work of the people. So then what then does it mean to organize people? Or what does it mean to be a community of faith around the work of the people? as a way of giving honor and worshiping God. It's just a slightly just a, a, a shift, metanoia, a shift in the way we see thinking at of these gifts that we hold in these earth investors. So thank you. And first of all, thank you so much. Um, and so feel free to chime in. And this crowd is usually not slow in chiming in. Do you have the lights on? Do you want to? Uh, yeah, we can turn on. Thank you. Did I hear you say that, um, and you said it as a not good enough, I'm um, really with not good enough. But 3% to 17% in terms of faculty representation. Um, and FTE was in the center of a lot of that. So I want to say you, you, you need to give some shout out to that work, even if it's not um, good enough. And what was the span? Was that the 50 year span? 50 year span. So I think the number is two thirds of. Uh African Americans that are serving in theological schools uh, are FTE fellows, yeah. and uh, why that's good. I mean, I think all the work we're doing is is important and essential. Yeah. It's just not going to be sufficient. Right. So I just I want to shout that out though because I think what that shows is that institutions can make a difference. Right? Yeah. And then I want to ask though, <laughs> what have you learned about how best to engage in mentoring partnerships with institutions of theological ed education to, to, to make that pipeline really move in a way that it was not 50 years ago. And you know, what are the best lessons of how best to support um, from discernment all the way through professional uh, careers and really Retirement. Yes, great question. I think I think we're still trying to figure that out. Um, I would say this: that diversity is hard work. Mm -hmm. It's more than a notion. And um, I got the battle stars. <laughs> <laughs> but um, what I realize is that we are not well practiced in working with and conversing with people outside of our own tribe. We're just not. And for us, you know, one of the things we, you know, historically our organization has been um, founded by and for, for, for the most part, the main line. And, you know, working with ATS, you can see all these shifts or whatever, so, you know, we can work with a broader diversity. So on one hand, we have our existing partners that have a eyebrow raise and say, uh, it's new FTE still for us. And on the other hand, we got the new folks who are saying, why do you want to work for us? I mean, why do you want to work with us? Because we don't really see anything that reflects who we are in the work that you're doing. So you have that, you know, you have those people on both sides. And I think is if you can get people in a space long enough tell this story, 
to hear one another's deepest speech and to begin wrestling with some of the kind of questions, then you can you know, start to kind of work on that. But it's, it really is tough work. And what I, what I also realize is that there's a lot of fear. Um, you know, fear of failure. Um, there's a fear around um, are you good enough to do whatever it is that you're called to do in terms of role of leadership. And then there's fear of displacement. So, you know, well, you know, then if you start bringing in a, you know, a few scholars of color at one time, whatever, you know, that, that, that sends a message. And, you know, what is the message? Is the message in line with the vision that you set out for? And you know, when you start thinking about um, cohorts of folks, and, you know, if you start to think strategically about how you put them together in terms of PhD programs, and uh, they reflect more persons of color than um, non-persons of color, it raises questions and it raises fears about people wondering whether or not, at the time come, whether they're being displaced. So there's a lot of work that you have to do around helping people understand and articulate the vision of what this divinity school is about. And any other school, I mean, it's, it's the same challenge that I have as well. Um, the other thing that I've, you know, that we've learned is that in terms of part, in terms of the pipeline aspect, of it is a kind of linear um, way. I mean, it's a linear way of thinking about the work, but it's the easiest way to kind of um, explain it. Most of our institutions support and advocate and resource a privileged pathway to ministry and teaching. <coughs> a middle class person goes to college and maybe maybe spend a year or two somewhere there about and then they go to seminary. And then depending on their education background, their college level, or maybe they can go right into a PhD program, et cetera. But um, that doesn't represent the broad diversity of Christians in the United States who are exploring different pathways of ministry, which then makes the job more complex because then you know, you're trying to attend to these multiple diverse pathways. Some folks are they go to Bible college, start pastoring, go back to seminary, and then they go on and get a PhD. Well, we got folks who are going and get a PhD and then they go and become president of a Bible Institute. Um, and these are not folks who just go to evangelical school. These are folks who go to like Princeton. And then they go and serve, you know, they want to serve their community. So the, the pathways to ministry are very diverse and our institutions are not set up or equipped, particularly because they're stressed, to deal with the multiple pathways. So what we're inviting people to do is assimilate to a particular trajectory um, in the work. Um, so when it comes to actually supporting that pipeline, then it's about how you hand off folks to different stages. And what, what we found out is that, so take a place like Chicago. Um, they are, or I don't know if this is the case, but Chicago, Atlanta, there are programs that were, the theological schools received to do high school programs. So that's like YTI, Youth Theological Initiatives. There are schools that got grants to do like um, programs for exploration vocation at the college level. There are <clears throat> institutions that got these large grants to do transition to ministry, which are basically like medical residency programs. And then you have faculty who may come through FTE and you know got a PhD. So you may have all these disparate groups in one geographical, geographical area, and they've never gotten together and talk about, here's what we're doing you know, at the high school level, here's what we're doing at the college level, here's what we're doing at the post-college level, the gap year, here's what we're doing at the seminary level, here's what we're doing at the PhD year. But to even know who the players are in the room who are working on these different um, 
segments within the leadership pipeline and building a relationship enough where they can be in conversation where they can pass folks on to the next stage would be instructive. But the thing is, is that usually you got one person who's running the department or a part-time person. And I mean, people are just stressed. So trying to get them together to meet and have conversation takes a lot of coordination. And usually that coordination can't happen within a respective institution. So um, you need, what we found out is that you need someone who can bring the ecology of institutional leaders together to have those conversations. And, um, and you're still gonna you know, have to wrestle them down in terms of saying, this is this is a value proposition and worthwhile your time to forego something else to come in. So I have a question about the representation of faculty and students. One of the charts uh, it was period from 2007 to 2014. And I was struck by the um, the breakdown of faculty of color, Latino, Asian, and African American, at evangelical and uh, mainline universities and so on. It seemed to show that faculty of color were growing in terms of percentage-wise uh, at um, evangelical seminary compared to uh, mainline. And there was a chart on the side. I, I wasn't clear if that was sort of a kind of a, an aggregate of theological seminary where it indicated that roughly like 17 percent faculty of color as a total percent as a percentage of total faculty and 38 percent um, students of color as a percentage of um, yeah student and theological seminaries in general sense so I was curious do we know why um, that growth has occurred in evangelical seminaries and I mean is it a representation or reflection rather of um, theological views of the faculty in terms of communities that they come from or are there other factors in terms of uh, I don't know aggressive recruiting on the part of evangelical seminaries and so on yeah I mean I think it's all over the board um, the last half of the 20th century has been about the rise of evangelical institutions um, we have more evangelical institutions in the last I think Dan, Dan said some, some ridiculous number like that maybe 100 new institutions in the last 50 years um, that have come online. And so there is an element of recruitment that, um, that I think is inherent within those institutions that are not necessarily within the main line. And as the main line has kind of retrenched and kind of declined, um, I mean, it's kind of like, you know, maybe perhaps they're taking for granted that these persons will always be showing up on the doorstep. So I think there's a little bit of that. I think um, you also have the, uh, there are four, no, there's six, I think, new uh, Asian, Korean serving theological schools that come online um, in the last four years, somewhere there about. And so they are now outpacing um, historical theological, black theological schools in terms of, um, student population with so, but both of those institutions tend to be more uh, theologically um, moderate or conservative and then where you have with the historical black theological seminaries they tend to be more socially progressive theologically conservative so I think that's, that's, you'll see some of those divisions as well the other piece of that is that still the vast majority of PhD programs are in mainline institutions um, or non-religious institutions. So, which there's not a number here. Well, yeah. Um, so you have kind of 52 and 45 percent of African Americans that kind of hover in these kind of two spaces in that regard. So, I don't think there's one particular answer. I think it varies. I think what the what all of this demonstrates is that the narrative of the landscape within the U.S. is very diverse. There is no one kind of meta narrative that says this is how Christianity is evolved. And I think it varies from place to place. And I think in the future, what you'll see is that Christianity in Hyde Park or even Chicago is going to look very different from Christianity in Indianapolis or somewhere else. In that. So that would make it much more difficult to do a kind of comparative analysis in, in the sense of why uh, more founding would be developed in school. Right. Some, in some instances, the requirements might not be as rigorous. Uh, 
whereas in other instances where even though you're sitting there, I mean, I suppose there might be doctrinal requirements for uh, founding members, for example. And sometimes it's about trying, you know, trying to find a job. So, you know, it's, it's wherever the opportunity avails itself. So. Um, thank you for this presentation. I thought it was very insightful. Um, I have a question that is somewhat provocative, um, but is related to the rise of the nuns and unaffiliated event. Um, I think kind of permeated your presentation, but it's also the conversation in theological spaces and religious spaces, um, trying to figure out what that means for us and what we do with it, um, and how it relates to the Christocentricity of theological education in the United States based on the kind of historic theological education growing out of denominations and kind of the, I can think of four or five divinity schools and seminaries in the U.S. that aren't affiliated with a particular denomination or theological tradition. Um, and a lot of the narrative coming both from the seminaries and the churches is how to reclaim or repatriate the nuns or the unaffiliated or create new programs that seek to identify their interest in social justice or their interest in other work to kind of get them to see ministry in the church as a venue and vehicle for which that can happen. But what I haven't seen a lot of in both theological education and in thinking about kind of religious institutions in the community is about how to reach the nuns and unaffiliated who aren't seeking to repatriate into, say, a Christian space, but who are still interested in questions of theology and even of ministry. And so thinking about what theological programs, especially in spaces like Chicago or Vanderbilt or Union or Harvard, um, how you create spaces for ministry education and theological education that doesn't seek to Christianize that work, but seeks to honor these students' not affiliation and prepare them for ministry in non-confessional spaces. Yes. <laughs> That's the question to draw to our work. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think, so, yes. I mean, I, I, what I would say is this, is that Christianity has always been diverse. I mean, that's what we see in the patristics. I mean, folks arguing over, you know, who, 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 you know, who has the right thinking of orthodoxy about how we're going to lead. I mean, part of it is, that, you know, it's, it is a result of the institutionalization and the kind of carrying of faith forward. But um, they've always been, they they probably have always been people who are on the fringes, or as I hear some folks, I'm Christian and other. Um, as what many of those persons probably were in, or some of those people were in the um, early aspects of the faith. I think the other piece is that um, our faith at least Christianity is built around or centered or is centered or founded by a young adult person of color doing volunteer service on behalf of the department. And so that for some in a kind of in a Thurman-esque way of thinking of it, it's, it's a high, it, you know, it, it may be considered kind of a low crystal, but a high uh, uh, human agency. About what it means to be more like the one in whom their faith is in. So I think what you see with these these uh, young adults or these young leaders is not that they're not committed, not that they're not interested in spirituality, but they're trying to figure out how they can practice a kind of religion or spirituality that is more accessible and can be in conversation with um, the other world religions. So how do you see? I guess to follow it up, the theological institutions serving that population. Um, I guess that's really the crux of the question. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think there are ways to do it. I mean, from what I know of uh, Dr. Hopkins' work or whatever, there's things that he's doing that, that I think gets at some of that. Um, but it also assumes that, you know, there's not a there's not a monolithic canon. That we're all working out of different canons. Um, and they can be, you know, they can be the, the majority canon for a particular subset or whatever, but the verse community have, have always been working out of the verse canons. Yeah, thanks very much for this. I, I have um, 
I want to be sure I followed the data correctly, and, and so I need to ask first if I got you right, and then secondly, if I did get you right, I have a question. Right. Um, it looked to me like the most significant demographic discrepancy between the U.S. Census and the composition of theological faculties was gender, where 23% of the faculty is female and 50% of the population is female. I don't think there's any discrepancy remotely close to that. If I, and if I got that right, my question is something like this. Given the volatility of the categories here in various ways, um, an institution that wants to think about floating its boat up in the way you're talking about it, if it made its hallmark matching the census and its faculty, would that process alone be address the other issues of diversity, about the nuns, about race, and things like that? In other words, if the focal point becomes gender, does the pursuit and acquisition of a gender representation that is like the census get us relatively close to the other indices that we want to get or not? That's a great question. How much do we know about that? How much do we know about that? I think there's still a lot of research that needs to be done. But I, I would say this is that there are diversities within diversity. And so, um, <coughs> I would caution to say that if you, you know, let's say if you do use gender, um, I, you know, I remember a, a colleague of mine would say that, you know, that everyone, you know, everyone who may look like you is not necessarily working out of your same kind of world view. Right. And so, even if you were to, to say, follow the census with all women, um, you assume that there's other diversities that will come with that, whether the orientation, geography, <coughs> theology, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I think you would just have to test for the other diversities that you might want to get, or you end up <coughs> duplicating what you have, but now it's just swinging to the other side, which is on uh, the women's side, the other side of the house. One of the reasons, just to follow up, if that's attractive as, as a possibility, and I, I just don't know if it's right or not, is. You know, I, I spent some time looking recently at, um, at uh, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences mm -hmm. demographics on religion instruction. And you were talking earlier about mentoring people through college. Right. I mean, one in four intro courses in religion are taught by adjuncts. Yeah. So the idea that we can expect college faculty to help us see this through is about as tenuous as expecting the churches with the nuns in this environment. So, you know, I think to the degree that the data can give us sort of benchmarks like that, mm -hmm. that's really key in all this because I think the, the passing through system, I mean, I started recruiting students in 1985, right. and it's totally different now in just the way you're saying, which is to say you could rely on undergraduate institutions and churches mm -hmm. in a way you just can't anymore. So bars like that one about women, if we could disaggregate the numbers and know something about what it would mean to have 50% women vis-a-vis -vis these other things, it seems to me that would be really interesting to know. Well, I think you asked the right question. And I want you to go and get the data. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's the data. Well, I think the other thing, too, is this, that uh, ATS doesn't have the only data. ATS only no, has the data right, right. in theological school. But the vast majority, the vast majority are going, I mean, if you want to find out, let's say, all women and all persons, well, I mean, everyone who's, who's serving, you have to go to NCS, and get that data as well because a lot of folks are in undergraduate um, divisions of religion. 1998 AAR survey, those kinds of things are yeah. really good for this data. Yeah. So um, I know a lot of us. Say. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, a lot of work that FTE does obviously is with doctoral students um, and sort of progressing people to the doctorate path. My question is, have you considered or are you considering ways in which non-doctorate students are able to engage the academy. I'm thinking particularly because there's uh, a lot of students are going dual degree to professional schools, mm -hmm. going out into the workforce, doing things, um, law, social service, community organizing, justice, and things like that. Um, and they seem to sort of hint at a lot of your, um, not just throwing against the wall, new curricular ideas that can sort of yeah. spawn out. So the question is, have you considered, or are you working on ways in which those types of uh, um, professional experience um, students and graduates who don't have doctorate degrees can actually work for the academy. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, we don't, and I only focus on the doctoral piece of our work. That was my assumption of him working. Uh, that was my kind of working assumption in terms of uh, presentation here. But um, outside of the doctoral students, we've actually moved further back in the pipeline. So we're not doing as much at the seminary as we once were in terms of getting like, we used to get like fellowships and that type of thing, whatever. But we're moving further back in the pipeline because there are large numbers of young adults in the gap year college who haven't even begun to even um, explore questions of meaning and purpose. So I got this kind of working typology of, of folks in college. You got a person who goes to college that does the family business. My mother was a doctor, my grandfather's doctor, I'm a doctor. You got a person where the parent pays you to, to get the degree that they want you to get. Um, you got the person who goes to school for the STEM disciplines and to make a lot of money. And then the fourth person is, they don't really know what they want to do. The thing is the four year degree is to kind of figure out at least some sense of where you're gonna land or whatever. And so we know that that's a, in terms of, when you think uh, in a systems way or whatever, that's an important leverage point to think about how you begin people asking questions around vocation and think about ministry as a way in which you might do that. As it relates to the practitioners, you're right, there are a lot of folks that are going and doing dual degrees or they're doing Ministry and something else. They're doing that and they're running a nonprofit. I mean, I, uh, I got a few fellows who graduated, started the nonprofit, and now they're doing a worship service and ministry outside the nonprofit. It's like, you know, like a business event or something like that. So, um, and they are, I mean, you know, they are engaged, but to the extent where they are coming back. Um, and being more invested in the kind of academic set or theological schools thinking about that's a market in which they can tap into the ongoing, you know, maybe it's a uh, certificate program, ongoing kind of education. Um, I don't know to what degree the schools are actually going on, at least across the board. Uh, maybe we have a couple more questions, and I'll be one of a couple. <laughs> um, I think, thank you so much for uh, spending the time and the presentation. Um, one of the things I've noticed over the years, and it's been many moons now, um, the, it's one factor that sometimes prohibit or becomes a exciting but nonetheless a challenge for diversification is the unstated culture of white institutions. Yeah. <coughs> white institutions. And I think I've seen those uh, underrepresented by there aren't new figures have been made, but you know, people of color, students um, who have been in, involved with predominant white culture, they're able to negotiate the bi culture reality. Right. Whereas the majority of folks of color have no exposure to, you know, predominantly white culture. And again, that's in the pretty commons white culture, black culture, but I think right. you know. Um, and maybe at some point, I don't know, FTE or ATS or Q or somebody might think about that part. Because that's like a non, I mean, how does one quantify that? How does one provide space? Because I've met over the years, uh, in my own case, you know, I went to white school, started, I've been white school since I was 14, right? Mm -hmm. So I can go all, you know, I can put my blue jeans on and go hang out on 630 Cottage. Right. I can also go downtown and meet with people and sell this $100 ball of wine. <laughs> um, you know, go to the board, the deans, and student, you know, and other people. Terry and others who have, uh, most people in here actually. Uh, so I'm, I don't have really a question, but an observation. I just wanted to surface that because I think culturally, sometimes, I mean, there's a proper way to engage in direct education in America. Mm -hmm. That's, I don't care, green, yellow, or right. orange. So given that presupposition, it seems to me there also has to be some attention to um, recognizing that there differences in cultural approaches to the <clears throat> presupposition of standards of excellence. Yeah. Um, you know, somebody said, well, you know, we went to the reception and all they had was cauliflower. Where was the fried chicken? You know, so I was like, why did you fried chicken? Why did you bet? We but it was just right. a question right. that to me raised this issue of, of culture. I'm not really, you know, trying to ask you to think about, I mean, an answer, but maybe something that the different institutions um, at some point, like, because I've, I've run across people from who are brilliant, you know, that just could not 
they could not handle the predominantly white culture. And just for them, as you know, for a lot of us, we're gifted or we're we experienced or we're blessed or we actually enjoy it. <laughs> Switching all kinds of, you know, we enjoy cultures and people. But there it really is, I think that might also, for some predominantly white institutions, help draw the pipeline. For faculty as well. You know, it, it's, uh, it can wear on the, on the body. You know? You know, people want to say to me, I smile every day, <laughs> especially women of color, so Latina, African yeah. American, maybe Asian as well. So, again, it's not really, it's just something we might want to think about. I don't know how to do it. But. I mean, part, part of what you're talking about is like, how do you qualify and quantify the, the water in which they're swimming? I mean, they, they're so not aware of the space in which they live and breathe. Um, until they actually bump up to something, you know, they're actually outside of water. And um, I was at an ATS board meeting last week, and they were talking about, so, you know, do you get in, I mean, do you address any of the issues related to how the cultural community that person of color have to make when they go and work in predominantly white institutions? And you raise a great question, but I don't even know how you even get there. I mean, I don't even know how you help majority institutions understand the kind of community that people of color have to uh, take every day to be in those spaces, whether they do that well or not. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, unless you, you know, flip it on them and then they're, I mean, that might be the cl- closest way to help them understand that. But I think to your to your larger question about how, how you help people kind of navigate institutions, the ones who know how to navigate institutions well are the ones who show up in our on our doorsteps. Which I think, to your point, speaks to, I mean speaks to the earlier point that I made about part of what we have within this country is a is a particular trajectory and a privileged pathway, which those who know how to navigate that well, then they will be successful, and those who don't. Um, you know, kind of limp along and try to, you know, figure it out. And um, I'm not really sure how, you know, I'm not really sure how you actually address that, but I think you're right, it is an important piece. At least with the doctoral students that we work, we help them try to, we help them think about um, navigating the system and the kind of uh, cultural kind of indicators that that they need attention. I mean, this is probably this is a dense book, but I think, you know, your old colleague, this is probably one of the best pieces to get at, which is some of the significations. Because well. um, I think that piece really can begin to help folks think about the ways in which we signify um, or not, and the way it plays out within the larger mainstream and within the actual um, people's side of culture. I, I remember, and we can continue over to bubbly, but I remember um, when I was 14. I think you two but I know I just said, you know, all first stories. I said when I was 14, I went to a white school, you know, and. Um, it's funny how they were called white back in the day, now it's totally different. Um, and we actually, there were like 12 boys, 12 African Americans out of 200 boys. Mm-hmm. And they actually, it was very interesting, just the feeling very ahead of the curve. I have, I mean, very ahead of the curve. Um, but they actually hired an African American male to be our cultural, to help us with cultural competency, mm-hmm. both to affirm African American culture, but also how to explore predominantly white cultures. And it was just so good. It was just like Dice and the James Brown over Sunday. Um, but it was just appreciating oneself and also appreciating the space that one is in yeah. in a positive way. Not yeah. that you don't lower the critique, but I think that's some, for some folk who haven't gone through that, that cultural commute, sometimes become a long drive on 94 as opposed to a short turn, you know, around the block. Yeah. And I don't, again, I don't know how to do it, but I just think it's, uh, it's great. I think we... Uh, Maybe we want to affirm our speaker again. We 
We thank you for listening to or viewing our podcast. For more information and for other podcasts, please see our website, divinity.uchicago.edu slash podcasts. Copyright, the University of Chicago Divinity School.